Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 653. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. Today is March 19th, 2021. All right, welcome back to another show of Anglican Unscripted. It's, it's Friday. Friday is a little more casual for us because, well, casual Friday is a thing in, in the 21st century. And George and I want to be, be full of that as well. And so just if you get a chance, like the program, share the program, comment on the program. George, lots of comments in the last episode. Very impressive. wonderful comments. Yeah. Really great comments. Yeah. We should just have an episode sometime, like once a month, where we just read the comments and respond to the comments. Well, Actually, Kevin, uh, I had to spend several hundred dollars this past week to get these glasses. Why? Because in our comments a few months, a month or so ago, sure. somebody said, I can't watch anymore because your glasses are always reflecting. So I went out and I got a new pair of glasses and had to pay extra for this and crystal, non-reflective, anti-glare <laughs> stuff. Now, they're fantastic, but I'm about 300 bucks. So What's if, if the person who complained wants to help reimburse and cover the cost. <laughs> well, now, I always get the anti-glare glasses, but I got talked into the blue. Oh, you need to get the blue lenses because they help you if you're in front of the computer monitor all the time. Oh, I'm in front of the computer monitor all the time. So I'll get the blue tinted anti-glare. Well, the blue tint works against the anti-glare, and so you have glare again. So look, if you look right there, there's the, the, the little lights that right in my eyes. So... Oh, George, it's... <laughs> and here I've got the sun coming on from four or five different windows yeah. and uh, with the uh, light above, and there's no mirror. I don't look like a villain in the Indiana Jones movie as a Nazi or something <laughs> with my glasses tinkling in the light. That's good. Yeah, you look good. George, you look good. Four or five. Uh, I'm yeah. cold, cold, but good. Should we tell people what happened? For the last week, when I go for my bike ride, it's been 80, 85, and I've been getting used to it. Yeah. It's almost summer. Well, it is summer in Florida. And then a cold front came through, and I woke up this morning at 60 degrees, and I see that George is in his wool uh, uh, sports jacket there. A little little chilly, are you, George? Wool jacket, wool pants, uh, vest, shirt underneath, and I have the heat on in the office. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, George. Well, we have the windows open here at, at the RV camp. Uh, let's get on to the news. Uh, we predicted it. We're the wonderful prognosticators of what happens in the news. And we said if there was a dear Anglican letter for the wonderful um, statement that came from the the ACNA's House of Bishop, there's certainly going to be a dear gay uh, Roman Catholic letter in response to what came from the Vatican last week. George, boom. Yeah. Uh, by the time we uploaded the show, they were all appearing everywhere. Oh, I was so, so shocked that the Roman Catholic Church would do this. I can't believe the Vatican, after all the progression they've had since Vatican II, would, would go back on their word. And yep, dear gay Roman Catholic. Strange stories. Well, just like the ACNA had one squarely bishop, and the Episcopal Church has about 200 squarely bishops, well, the Roman Catholic Church has a few hundred squarely bishops also. A couple squarely cardinals. Uh, gag squarely cardinal. Well, slick squarely cardinals. Yes, yeah, slick uh, oh, right, We, After the uh, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith uh, released its statement saying that, they, that the Church cannot bless same-sex uh, unions or partnerships because that would be blessing of sin, uh, the reactions came. Uh, the Bishop of Antwerp for instance, wrote that he was mortified, and this was wrong and terrible. We had several German bishops pop in. Um, so the liberal European church, as well as some American and uh, Brazilian and other clerics, have started writing pastoral letters, essentially disassociating themselves from the CDF opinion or teaching. And then we've had some cardinals, Kevin Farrell, for instance, who's an American who's on the liberal side, if you will, of the Catholic mm -hmm. equation, uh, being very slick by saying that we will still, nonetheless, never mind what came out, we will still offer full and complete pastoral support to gay and lesbian Roman Catholics. So he did, he essentially tried to 
square the circle of the the boss says no but we're still gonna go wink wink nod nod and make every pastoral accommodation that we can so we'll do it but we won't call it a blessing we'll call it something else sure. uh, if you will mm -hmm. And so that's, that's and now see that's what Cardinal Farrell is slick. He didn't say that we're going to ignore it, but basically his language will be used by those further down the food chain to allow them to continue what they were doing and bless same-sex unions. Which is kind of in the modus operandi of the liberals, is we're going to change the the language so words don't mean what they used to mean. When we say blessing, it doesn't mean the blessing that the the Pope means we mean blessing in this way. When we say blessing, it's not the blessing that they wrote about in in the Vatican. We mean blessing to be more all encompassing, uh, more than a spiritual uh, ethos from God. And that's you know that's how they can change what what they think is happening. And one of the things we're saying is, I know I've said this before, but I'll say again. The trajectory the institutional Roman Catholic Church is going is the one that the Anglican Communion has gone down. Not all Roman Catholics, not all Anglicans, so I want to make that clear, have gone down this road. But the the arguments and the issues that I've seen and our that we've seen, Kevin and I, in the years we've done this and in my years as a priest, are resurfacing. I can remember in 2003 at the primates meeting in London, which was held as an emergency after the uh, general convention affirmed the election of Gene Robinson as Bishop of New Hampshire. At the press conference, uh, Frank Griswold, who is the primate of the American church, the presiding bishop, made the statement that, well, the church of Nigeria has its truth and we have our truth and we are being faithful to our truths. So it, what Frank was saying is that there is no universal right or wrong. In the letters that have come out in the public statements and comments from the European liberal bishops, we're getting that same argument. It may be wrong it, for Cardinal Sarah in Guinea, or it may be wrong for the Polish bishops, but it's right for us in the Netherlands or Belgium or Germany, because we have different truth standards. And this lack of universals is part of the modern problem. As you said, Kevin, words mean what we want them to mean. They mm -hmm. don't mean what they always mean. We don't have a common definition of words. And, mm -hmm. uh, and here's the funny thing. The online dictionary is changing all the time. You know, they, they, they took out the word slavery. We're not going to have mm -hmm. the word slavery in our dictionary. How does that what? work? I mean, <laughs> how do you take out a word? You can't delete words from our language and well no, it's, they it's like that monty it's that like monty python skit where the the fellow wants to buy a book of british birds but he wants the one without the gannet because he doesn't like the gannet so he wants the that's right no uh, you know that that's where we're, when monty python is l true life we know we're in a screwed up world <laughs> when the babylon b is actually the news it's it's so strange all right well yeah, I've said before that you know the religion of woke is the religion of unforgiveness. Uh, it's the you know no mercy, no grace, no forgiveness. That's the woke religion. I kind of saw that in a bishop's letter about Swanee students, where they threw down the hammer for a bunch of kids. Um, and you and I know this because we're older. I am so much wiser than twenty-year-old Kevin. And 16-year-old Kevin, George, if you met 12-year-old Kevin, he was just a, a pompous ass. Oh, and so I'm wiser now in, in how I respond to and in, in interact with people and what I say and what I do. You guys may not think so. But no, I am wiser. And so when I see a bunch of students at a, a sporting event get a little crazy and say some stupid things, I'm like, that's because they're stupid kids. Yes. George, you were never stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I was a stupid kid. Uh, oh, my. I don't want to go into uh, my life story because, uh, Kevin, you went to the University of Wisconsin. Sure. And whatever we got up to at Duke, 
they were ten times worse <laughs> at Wisconsin. Oh my! But well, yeah, before no. show we're, we're comparing our school, uh, the oh. stupidest things kids did in school, and um, uh, just a quick story. Uh, the year before I went to University of Wisconsin, um, the the popular frat in town stole a school bus. Drunk guys just driving around. Uh, stupid. Kevin is telling you right now, it was stupid. Driving a bus through town and got lost in a back street and they drove off uh, a dock into Lake Mendota. Bus sank. Kids got out. They're all safe. Nobody wanted to say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> guy shows up to drive his bus the next day where's my bus <laughs> and I'm just like you know it's and that's stupid kids doing stupid stuff george and swanee students went to a rally and got stupid by the time i was a senior in college i was a member of fraternity the saes mm -hmm. sigma alpha epsilon right. and because i guess i matured earlier than some of my friends i was the uh, fraternity bail bondsman Meaning on the weekends, I had to have two or three hundred dollars cash to bail out uh, members Stupid. of the fraternity who were stopped for drunk driving mm -hmm. or public intoxication or they were caught trying to steal uh, a, a, a Kentucky Fried Chicken sign. Uh, you know, I have a, I have a relative stuff like who that. was so drunk he was sawing off the top of a, a, a meter where you put your, your coins to a parking meter, got caught. Please, red-handed. That's what stupid people do. Well, some stupid kids at the University of the South Swanee at a lacrosse game allegedly yelled racial epithets at members of the other team. Um, stupid. It's a stupid thing. However, the response has been extraordinary. Now the university president or university vice chancellor said, "We'll get to the bottom of this, just you know, as they would in my day or in your day, Kevin. You know, we'll get to the bottom of this, and we'll go find the bus it, at the bottom of the lake. We'll but, get to it." But the the thing where it's going is that in this current world, there's no forgiveness for stupidity. If you violate the woke the commandments, you cannot be redeemed. And in response to this Swanee stupidity, we had 23 Episcopal bishops sign a letter denouncing as unacceptable the racism of these students. Now, hear me right, friends. I'm not saying what the kids did were right. But what I'm also saying is that I haven't seen a letter from 23 bishops denouncing pro-abortion advocacy on the campus of Swanee. I have not seen them. Now, they got involved because Swanee is owned by the Episcopal Church, Province 4, which is the South. When Swanee puts on the vagina monologues, do we hear the bishop say anything? Do, when Swanee has somebody come and promote anti-Israel disinvestment and denouncing the Jews and all the sorts of craziness they get up to, we only hear it, we only saw this in this sort of public posturing of denouncing racism, which I don't think anybody is affirming. And, but the way they denounce it is, now, a good priest, a good bishop, in my opinion, would say, yes, right is right, wrong is wrong, and make clear this behavior was wrong, but they would put more time into how do you come out of a life, a worldview, that you would be tempted to say these things. You preach the gospel, you teach redemption, you say, you know, you can be forgiven, you can change, don't do this anymore. But if all you do is denounce and condemn and demand heads, that's not Christianity. No. No. Because I... Kevin, as you and I have shared, we are we have violated so many well, not major laws, <laughs> but smaller laws. <laughs> Mr. Meaners. <laughs> no uh, Mr. Meaners, that it were expunged from our records <laughs> after several years. No, I'm being <laughs> jokey. But the, the point is that no one is perfect but Christ. And if we were told that we could never be redeemed for our youthful indiscretions or for our sinful inclinations, there's no point in Christ having died on the cross. Well, I don't expect culture 
or the world to forgive me as a Christian or to forgive me. I don't expect them to have that ability to forgive. I do expect forgiveness within Christian circles. Um, famous case this week, her name was Alexi uh, Macamond. She was the new uh, editor for uh, Teen Vanity Fair. When she was young and stupid and a freshman in college, she tweeted something kind of homophobic. Kind of. She was um, not given the job at the last minute when the staff at Vanity Fair said, no, we can't have her because she's a homophobe. Because one tweet she made when she was a freshman 10 years ago, she lost this job. That you know, it's, it's a big job in New York to get that type of thing. The woke culture can't forgive. The woke religion doesn't allow for forgiveness. And uh, I don't want to see our bishops and Christian leaders walking around woke because you need to walk around as examples of Christ and bless and forgive and pray for and heal. I, I saw something that was really extraordinary on the national news where the White House has instituted a new policy that any staffer who used marijuana in the past is going to be dismissed. Well, that can't get rid of the vice president. And friends, do you remember Kamala Harris telling us in the, her run for presidency how she was one of the guys, or one of the gals, and smoked marijuana and listened to Tupac Shakur and all that good stuff? Well, if she were trying for a job at the White House as uh, deputy assistant director of the assistant director's deputy's office, she would be dismissed. Because, but as vice president, it doesn't matter. In other words, uh, there's a famous MSNBC anchor uh, who, uh, Joy Reid, who has had some really quite extraordinarily offensive remarks about gays and whatnot in the past, but she's never lost her job because, well, she said, oh, well, somebody hacked my account. Did I got to use that. I need to use that. <laughs> but because she, her position, uh, she had other, uh, she wasn't a white male Washington geek, the type Correct. who works in administrations. Mm -hmm. uh, she was a person of color who would this, that, and the other. So she had things to balance. But it wasn't a level playing field. The sort of thing that would get even this young woman, had, here, here's how things have advanced and how the left continues to eat its own. This young woman who lost her job at Vanity Fair identifies as African-American. Yeah. But evidently that's less of a uh, minority uh, uh, than the, being the gay. Gender, sex, yes. Um, well, here we are, March of 2021, and the only crime being reported in the press is white crime. There is no uh, Asian crime. There's no African crime, African American crime. Sorry, uh, there's no Latino crime. The only crime being reported and uh, thrown out there in mass is white crime. And we talked last week about Justin Welby responding to oh. a woman who was killed uh, in England. Okay, bef yeah. Before we get there, sure. it's the same topic, but I want to stay in this country before I go there. Oh, me too. <laughs> we had we had a terrible no uh, we had a terrible incident in Atlanta where a twenty one year old man went into a massage parlor mm -hmm. and killed eight people. He was a white guy, and the women who work in massage parlors, just like the people who work in your neighborhood nail salon, are predominantly Asian American. Many of them are illegal immigrants. Many mm -hmm. of them are brought over on contracts. This guy murdered eight women, I think, and. He did so after he was arrested because he wanted to combat this temptation he had that the, these women were tempting him sexually. Okay, this guy's a nut job. He's, he, he's a sick individual with some very severe mental health issues that he took out in a very violent way. Now, what is the response of the Episcopal Church? This is another example of the continued racism of whites against Asians. Hmm. Now, friends, I don't think there's no there's no racial angle here. It's a sick man doing an evil thing. He but went it's into but kill it's again been yeah. it's again been hijacked hmm. by the, the the political woke culture. 
so that we have, uh, I, I saw on MSNBC, we have an Asian American activist complaining, this is just another example of, of the oppression that Asians feel in this country. Now, Kevin, we were talking about this before. What the MSNBC anchor did not ask him about was, so did you get into Yale yeah. or Harvard <laughs> or the University of California at Berkeley? The, the, the because... biggest racism that happens in America is done at the education level. Is done at the, the the level of these you know uh, very liberal, very woke um, uh, individuals who said, "Well, listen, there's not enough black or, or gay or uh, um, Latino representation. Let's cut white admissions and we'll cut uh, Asian admissions to our universities." Yale was sued over it. The lawsuit was just dropped by the Biden administration. Harvard, Harvard surprise, was sued over. Surprise, surprise, yeah. surprise. <laughs> and uh, that suit was just dropped by the Biden administration. Um, the Supreme Court said you can't do that anymore. So if it ever went all the way through, they would be guilty and they would face big fines. But the Bidens don't want to touch this. The Harrises don't want to touch this. But there is strategic, systematic racism against Asians and white people at the university level. Yeah, there was a fun, I think it was, I found it amusing that last year the president, I think it was of Princeton, wrote a letter condemning Princeton University for its institutionalized racism. racism. <laughs> and admitted it. <laughs> then, and then the Department of Education then like suspended funding, whatever, because you have to sign these non-racial, non-racism waivers to get government grants. And the president of Princeton had to climb down uh, and basically admit, yes, I was just virtue signaling and you can't really believe what I was saying. He you follow have said all his the rules. Was hacked. Is it, <sighs> but the culture in this country and in Britain is getting so strange. And it's not, well, certainly isn't the country it was when we were young. But it's not even the country it was when Barack Obama left office. No, no. I mean, like I said, the only crime that is committed and reported is white crime. Uh, this happens also in England as well, where a uh, legal immigrant who was uh, refused admission into Britain uh, chopped up an uh, uh, innocent person and put her in a bag goes relatively unreported. Where oh, certainly a, a, a person Kevin and, of Kevin and I got a, yeah Kevin and I got an email uh, from our, one of our viewers it was an email or a comment I can't remember well, they we were contacted by one of our sure. viewers and saying you know Justin Welby's hypocrisy really is breathtaking and that uh, here we have the terrible Sarah Everard affair where a middle class a college educated thirty three year old woman is murdered on. Clapham Common by a uh, psychopathic police officer. And out comes the outrage and the men, you know, men are evil and white men are evil and and Justin Welby, we have to repent of the sin of institutional maleness. Or Whiteness. What, or male violence or pick, pick whatever phrase you want. Yeah. And one of our viewers said, you know, we had another case where a working class woman was chopped up by an immigrant who was re refused asylum and the fellow was waiting to be deported, but it never happens. And he chopped her up and they know it's him because his DNA is over the seven bags where the different parts of her body were found. And this isn't reported because it's not one of us who was murdered. In other words, it's not somebody, the sort of person whom the BBC hires or the newspapers hire mm -hmm. or whom the chattering classes consider one of themselves. The 30, Sarah Everard was a, a college-educated marketing executive. So she was one of us, and she was murdered by a white policeman, the symbol of oppression, whereas a working-class woman or a woman of lower-middle-class origins murdered by an immigrant doesn't register at all. We don't, and, and that's not the sin of maleness. That's just an unfortunate incident where a sick individual kills somebody. Well, they both were, but one is just the source like of Atlanta. outrage. Just like Atlanta, a sick individual killed many people. And mm -hmm. it, it's not about a sick individual. It's not about mental illness. 
it's about white racism against Asians or white racism against black people or white racism and I lost George. All right, we're back from some type of internet outage, so we're too old to remember exactly what we're talking about. So there's a little break in, whoa, you guys, uh, something with Justin Welby, hypocrisy, it's a common story, or just the, the, the story of what's going on with the, the woke hypocrisy is that the only crime is white crime. So that's that's our talk on wokeness. Uh, let, we forgot to mention this in the Roman Catholic section of our program, section one. Uh, Elton John was a little perturbed at the Vatican and the Pope for taking uh, this statement, making it public, and yet funding his last movie. Just as we claim Justin Welby uh, displays hypocrisy, Elton John was taking to social media to say that the Pope is a hypocrite. And what he was talking about was uh, the biopic Rocket Man about Elton John. The Vatican, through its investment arm, funded was one of the major funder funders for that movie and the rocket man movie which i've not seen so i can't affirm this That's my anything. personal experience uh celebrates elton john's homosexual gay uh relationships and his blessing and his marriage and all this and that so relton john's arguing that hey they're willing to make money off of my gay marriage but they're not even willing to bless some uh in real life what hypocrites uh, religion hypocrisy doesn't even make news anymore e even on unscripted we, we barely mentioned we only talk about the, the big hypocrisies that are out there no and, and that's true uh we saw this with justin lobby though in like the payday loan stuff he would come out against all these things and so whisper by the way we're invested in that <laughs> we own stock in that go like either sell the stock or stop complaining <laughs> I don't, you know, just you know, the Church of England involved in loan sharking, and Justin Welby condemns loan sharking. It's it's like uh, Captain Renault in uh, Rick's Cafe uh, gambling. I'm shocked that there's gambling here. Oh, here you're winning, sir. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, final story. Uh, Do we fit? Was the Elton John the final story? See, we're just so discombobulated no, with the internet thing. An exciting thing that is not Anglican related, really. Uh, the Israel Antiquities Authority this week announced that they have found some first century AD uh, scrolls in the Judean desert. Mm -hmm. And they are the Greek versions of portions of uh, Zechariah and Nahum, uh, Old Testament materials. And that there are some 60 other, there's several hundred other caves to be explored in the desert that may have to find these uh, treasures and they've not deciphered everything but it's really quite exciting the dead sea scrolls i think were found in the 40s the yeah the original this ones is the, this is the latest this is actually the first major find of this type since the dead sea scrolls mm -hmm. so it's going to take years to decipher everything and they're still finding them but what is exciting i think in what we saw with the dead sea scrolls um what well, before I'm getting too far ahead of myself. Evidently, when the, the sack of Jerusalem by the Romans in 74 AD, uh, the scrolls were taken out and hidden in the desert by religious groups right. in caverns. And the Jews were basically decimated by the Romans, and so they never really could come back and get them. And 2,000 years later, they're turning up because the desert atmosphere has perfectly preserved, has preserved these scrolls written on uh, sheepskin parchment. And one of the neat things is, is that how little, how similar the texts of these, of these scrolls that are contemporaneous with the time of Christ are to what we have in English translation today. And that it's just fantastic to see that, you know, the accuracy of the Bible that we have Maybe a word here and a word there, but you know, each scribe may have had a little tiny things. But yeah, a little comma there. It's just yeah, so it, neat. It, I mean, it, somebody did a study of of all the texts, and you know, except for a, a couple of cults that uh, existed in uh, Israel at the time, most of the the text is within you know ninety nine percent accurate and common to each other in all texts, which is great. Um, now they said this find these were buried, you know. 
the one that was the basket. The, they found a 10,000-year-old basket, too. 10,000-year-old uh, basket, yes. So they found a basket. Open basket. A basket for summer audience that was actually created before the universe. That's, you know, just amazing. You know, you didn't get the joke. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Well, I've only, here's the thing is, I've gone onto the Israel Antiquities website, mm -hmm. and they've not updated the English section. They've got the stories in Hebrew. I don't read Hebrew, but I can read, I can look at All pictures. that schooling and you don't do Hebrew? <laughs> I forgot. I forgot. And uh, the... Uh, and so we're only getting the story in English translation from the Jerusalem Post or Fox mm -hmm. News. And so I can't wait to see once the Israeli Antiquities Authority translates it, their web stuff into English, we can see what's going on. Because what's interesting to Fox News and to the Jerusalem Post may not be interesting to an observant Jew or Christian. No. <laughs> so let's, let's see what comes when we get the full details and the full reports. Yeah, but absolutely. what an exciting, tremendous find in the desert. You know, we, and that's the cool thing about the, the 20th and 21st centuries. We're finding all these things that uh, prove the accuracy of Scripture. We find you know texts from these characters in the Old Testament. We find coins and stuff that uh, link us to kings we thought never existed. In, in But they do. They were the Bible, and we, we now have uh, coins to prove it. And So we're finding out that the Bible is so much more historical than originally thought. So, hundred years ago, these German scholars were saying, you know, there's no proof that Moses ever existed, or all these kings ever existed, mm -hmm. or even David ever existed. And it's all Jewish myth and legend written to, written, uh, to justify or to give a national story to this tribe. And now, over the century, over the last century, we've seen archaeological discovery after discovery uh, confirming what Scripture has said, where we have the seal of, uh, of, the, you know, of one of the I am king, uh, I'm making oh, up yeah. a name now, but uh, no, I, I know Obadiah's, yeah. uh, you know, in other words, the, the, the hard historical, it's like uh, archaeological evidence is confirming the veracity of scripture. Now, it cannot speak to, you know, the party of the Red Sea and the miracles, but it, these people really did exist and live. They're not just fictional characters. So far, everything we have found has confirmed characters and minor characters, like the second cousin of somebody, somebody, somebody. Oh, we know they existed because it's right here. Yeah, it's, it, it is an amazing time to, to watch what's happening in archaeology. Uh, it's a horrible time to watch what's happening in our culture with wokeness and with uh, uh, the attacks on uh, perceived privilege and whiteness and, you know, all this craziness that's going on. But uh, oh, we can get it in our comments, Kevin. Did you see that one comment that two older white men criticizing a black woman, which by the author's <laughs> intent, which by the author's intent was like, well, that's a killer argument. It's as if the truth can only reside in pigmentation. Yeah, it can't. It doesn't have an existence uh, in itself. Mm -hmm. Such silly people we live with in the world today. Yeah. Well, uh, I had a great quote. Um, somebody I was following on Facebook uh, got into an argument with a troll, and her final comment that just shut the whole thing down because this, a younger troll said, I am old enough to know better. You're only old enough to comment. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I, I think that's the final, you know, result comment to all trolls out there. You know, it just, it's hard to see what social media has done to our society. It's hard to see what the internet has done to society, what this constant communication and analysis has done to our society. There's so much good found in technology, but we're finding a way to use it so badly. And that saddens me as a, a technologist. One of the things that I've mentioned again and again is how inept I believe the Lambeth Palace press office is in managing technology mm -hmm. and setting the agenda and you know Justin Welby's recently hopping on board the uh, the Sarah Everard case and men are evil. 
Um, compare that to a real master. Night. We're not going to talk about Donald Trump. That's too <laughs> close to home for many people. Let's talk about a real master of social media, Vladimir Putin. Oh. <laughs> Vladimir Putin challenges on social media, Twitter, Facebook, whatever, Joe Biden to a one-on-one -on -one live televised debate. Now, and that's all he had to say. Because what's the reaction of every sentient American? Oh my God, please no. <laughs> and but, then Biden's, and and uh, and now the Russians are able to say, oh, well, I guess you don't have a national leader who can appear on live TV and talk without a script, with the router roller, whatever they're called. Well, he can't even do it with uh, a teleprompter. But that's the big thing. I mean, wokeness is about bullet, bullying. I can't even say it at one o'clock in the afternoon. It, wokeness is all about bullying people into your thought and making sure they believe you. And if they don't, you shame them. Shame, 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 shame. They're being bullies. And so the second somebody stands up to a bully, Biden and his administration, oh, God, no, we don't want, we don't want to debate you. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So. And I think the other lesson is there's always going to be a better bully. And frankly, to become the dictator of Russia, you've got to be the best darn bully there D is. Yeah, he's on <laughs> 25 years now, isn't he? Don't mess with Vladimir Putin on social media if you don't want to have your head handed to you. No, it was a same day response, you know. And it is was so the the weed backers are getting closer, George. We should shut down. Um, like I said, it's it's a Friday show. It's a little frivolous, a little free for all, a little casual. And right in the middle of it, the internet went down for some reason, and so we kind of lost. You know, he's teasing me. He's out there with the. Bzzz, uh, so, Kevin. Yeah. For the for the uh, cranks who who write in, no, we're not supporting Vladimir Putin. No, we're not saying that stupid college kids should shout racial epithets. No, we're not saying that a nutcake should murder eight women in a massage parlor. We're not applauding the evil. We're commenting on the responses of people who should know better. And, ah, uh, I'm going to shut the door real quick because I have something I want to say real quick. All right, now that the guy who is trimming my bushes has moved on, uh, well, Kevin, that was fortuitous because I was able to tell our viewers about the corruption of the Church of South India. Oh, I was gone that long. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's oh, simply my. put, and I was taught this as a, a, a young little whippersnapper before I became wise, before I became old enough to know better. Racism, in its purest form, is just blaming another race for your problems. And that is what we're seeing in our culture right now with... Uh, the Asians blaming another race, the blacks blame, blaming another race, the whites blaming another race, the Latinos uh, blaming another race. That's the racism. And woke has taken its full head on and said, it's your fault, you white people. All right, well, that noise is bothering me. I'm going to get out of here. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 653 of Anglican Unscripted.